anyway, so this class is about linguistics. And what is linguistics? Linguistics is the scientific study of language, if you want to write down the uh, definition. So LX is how I, how I uh, typically uh, abbreviate uh, linguistics, and linguistics is the scientific study of language. And that's how I abbreviate language LG. By the way, if you don't see the blackboard, I am simultaneously having a, a separate video done of this uh, by our personal video equipment so that, so that it has widescreen. It, we've tested it. It shows the, shows, shows the board. I will get it um, uploaded probably tomorrow morning because I teach all day today. Uh, but then, you know, we have to go home, we have to, you know, do, change the format of the video, or oh, my husband will, I don't, I don't do that kind of stuff. So he will do that and then he will send an email to me and then I will upload it on Blackboard, I'll send you a link. So you will have a backup. So uh, this Zoom is if you want to be here when the class happens, that's an option. I don't know if it, it always works. Because like for instance, the first class day, did any of you notice that the network was down? <laughs> so uh, if the network is down, then the Zoom doesn't work. Uh, the recording cannot be done on Zoom. That's why we wanted to make sure that we have something like a backup, and that's uh, that was the personal investment. <laughs> so anyway, um, anyway, just a couple of a uh, couple of things about me. Um, I have this accent, and that's why you know I find it's important that you actually see my face when I speak, because um, because. I don't pronounce all the sounds like a native speaker. You will be learning about that. We'll, talk, we'll be talking about accents and different dialects. So can anyone guess where I come from? Ukraine. Uh, good guess, but further north. Finland. Did you say Finland? OK. Did you find that out earlier? Or did you just, do you know anybody from with a Finnish accent? <laughs> Okay, yeah, so that was very good. I uh, Usually we go all over the map of Europe before we get to, get to where I come from. I come from Finland and, uh, and I was a former English teacher. I taught English and Russian, so uh, back in my earlier life. But I've been in the U.S. for um, 25 years, no, 30 years actually, and that's Sam for 25 years, so time flies when you're having fun. Anyway, so I hope you all have the, the book. And this is the book. It's a lovely, hefty book. I made that little introductory video, so you seen me show it earlier. So it's the 12th uh, edition. If you have an older edition, it should be pretty much the same thing. But then, you know, if we do the exercises, I'm referring to the pages. Does anyone have an electronic version of it? OK, yes. So when we do some exercises, sometimes in class, then it may be kind of, you know, you need to know which page and, and what, what chapter and so on. But it's doable. So, OK. What do you want to know? What should we go over about the syllabus? Um, attendance, I have already mentioned. So part of the attendance I do need to add is that uh, please also uh, on Mondays and Wednesdays when we cannot meet in person, go to the, um, go to, you know, online. And I, I have posted something for every day uh, for Mondays and Fridays, every Monday and Friday, uh, or for the week, I didn't separate it because some students want to.
go online and and do more stuff at once so it's you know you can sometimes i have indicated that this is specific specifically for this particular monday or this particular friday but if it's just under the week then it really doesn't matter if you do it all at once or you know little by little but uh but because of this new attendance uh recording requirement uh especially the ones uh who are doing this online, please uh, go on Monday, Wednesday, Friday and click on the link so that I can mark you present. So um, it's, it's a little bit of a chore at your end, but that's what the administration wants, that you know, we have, um, we have that report of a record of, uh, of who has participated. I might do it like you know on a weekly basis, but anyway, so it's a, it's a little bit of a bookkeeping for us and it's a little bit of a chore for you too, but we do what we are asked to do, right? So, so you've got the book, uh, do you want to know about the requirements of this class? They're very straightforward, <laughs> so it's on page uh, Three, two on your hand on the on the uh, syllabus. So my grading uh, scheme is just uh, very normal. Uh, Ninety is an A, eighty is a B, seventy is a C, sixty is a D, and anything under sixty is an F. So that's there's nothing strange there. Uh, we will have three tests during the semester and they are each worth 10% of the grade. So altogether those tests come up to, to 30. We will have a, have a midterm, it's not an in-class midterm, I'll post it online, and you will have one day to access it, but then you have to do it on one sitting. Uh, and you have two hours like you would have. I mean, you would have less in class for the midterm, but so you actually have two hours for that <clears throat> online. And then we have the final, that's 40% of the grade. And then there's a little extra credit uh, toward the end of the class because it's at that point when students are like, is there gonna be an extra credit? We're not supposed to have extra credit, but we are having extra credit anyway, so. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's something that everybody should do, uh, even if you have uh, done well. Uh, well, that's my recommendation. Um, so uh, you already have checked the, I put a little voice over PowerPoint. Um, can you all access those easily enough? Do you? Uh, the voice or the, uh, the the trick with the voice over PowerPoint is that you have to um, click on the little you know play button, uh, the sound button, and have your sound on so you can hear it. So you've been able to listen to it. So you 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 have had already um, a, a, an introduction to um, the kinds of things. We'll introduce you more to linguistics today. So, um, so uh, there was this uh, notion of description versus prescription. Let's talk about what linguistics is. Let's first talk about what it is not. And uh, our approach here in this class will be a descriptive approach, as I mentioned on, the, on that PowerPoint. So it's a descriptive approach. Uh, which means that this is not a class where you learn what proper English is. Uh, those are other kinds of classes, like for instance a freshman writing class where you learn about punctuation rules and about when to use who versus whom. You won't be learning those kinds of prescriptive rules in this class. But after you've taken those, this class, you will have, have a better understanding of why we sometimes use whom. It's, you know, in object positions and so on. So our approach will be descriptive. What does that mean? It means that we will be describing how English language is built. So uh, 
So just a purely a descriptive approach. Um, like for instance, um, in a chemistry lab, um, your professor or your TA will give you a substance and you need, you need to describe, try to figure out what, what this substance is. And so you're kind of like describing what it's composed of, what other substances. And that's basically what we're doing in this class. So we're looking at the English language and seeing how it's built. We are not saying what is right or wrong. That's not our business. Linguists don't prescribe what is right or wrong. So, um, so it's a different approach, the prescriptive approach. And uh, the prescriptive approach is the approach that, that uh, tells you what, what is proper, that's not proper English. If you say something like, you know, I ain't got no money, somebody might say, oh, that's not proper English. You have ain't there, ain't is bad. Um, what happens if you say ain't according to the prescriptive, uh, prescriptive approach is this. If you say ain't, your father will faint and your mother will put you to a barrel of paint. Your sister will die, your brother will cry, and your dog will call the FBI. Bad things happen if you say ain't. That's the prescriptive approach. We are not doing the prescriptive approach. So um, we won't tell you what is good and what is not. So. Um, uh, the prescriptive approach always involves a value judgment that there is a better English than somebody's, somebody else's English and that's what we should you know, aspire to in order to be somehow better citizens or what have you. But of course that's not true. What linguists, we linguists are interested in and I invite you to become linguists of sorts during this class as well. I'll sometimes send you a message and I call you dear linguists. So, um, so uh, what we are interested in is how language is put together. That's the interesting thing and how real people in real situations, in different situations, use language. And it can be the standard American English. Sure, that is another dialect of English, but it is just a dialect of English. And then we have all kinds of other, other Englishes. So if we make a description of the list of pronouns, personal pronouns, uh, of standard American English, what are they? First person, singular is I. What is the second, what is the second person singular pronoun in you? What is the third person singular in standard American English? There are several, keeps changing. He or she, and if you're talking about a, a horse or a book, it. it. And uh, then, of course, you know, now we are <coughs> adding the singular use of they also. That is a possibility, but it hasn't made its way to grammar books yet. But. You know, it's part of the description that some people are today using they for third person singular person. Okay, what is the first person singular plural? For first person plural, sorry. Us? Uh, yes, us in its uh, object form. What about its subject form? like when us is doing something. We. we, yes, good. And then the second person plural is, if I'm talking to you, you. and the third person plural is they. So, okay, what we have done 
now is we have described uh, the English um, personal pronoun system in its subject forms. So the object forms, that's another story. I becomes, um, I saw someone, but he saw me, mm -hmm. and, and so on. So he becomes him, she becomes her, we becomes us, you becomes stays the same. We saw you and we saw them. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> so we saw them. Okay, so those would be the object forms, but these are the subject forms. Now, uh, these, as I mentioned, these are the standard English forms, and, uh, and here already we have some language change going on. We'll see if it sticks, but you know, that remains, it always takes a decade or two to see if a change will stick in a language. But um, we have now described it, and we are not going to say you should not use they, for instance, as the third person singular. We're interested if that is actually happening, because that's the interesting thing, if that is actually happening. But let's now talk about Texas English. Texas English pronoun system in the subject forms uh, is a tad different, not much, but it's a little bit different. So where is the difference? We say y'all here. Y'all need to get the textbooks, for instance, <laughs> when I'm talking to y'all. If I say you need to get the textbook, it's, it, you know, it's uh, standard English form is ambiguous because it's like, am I t uh, is she talking to me only or is she talking to the entire class? So um, this is the problem. Uh, with the standard English pronoun system because you is used both for the singular you, like you need to do it, you one person, or you all need to do it, you, everybody I'm talking to needs to do something. So it, it, there's a built-in ambiguity which non-standard forms and, and linguists have to have a way of talking about the forms that are not exactly standard forms, just for descriptive purposes. Non doesn't mean that it's bad or anything. At some point, and some people, some prescriptivists say substandard. No, no linguist would say substandard. But non-standard is just the descriptive way that it is. It's not the standard English form. It's another dialect form. And in non-standard, uh, the Texas dialect, it is a non-standard dialect. Uh, there's no escaping of the fact, but it makes the pronoun system so much better in a way because it, it allows for this distinction between singular you and, uh, and, um, and plural y'all. Um, <clears throat> there are other uh, regional dialects that use other ways of saying y'all. I did my PhD at University of Southern California and lived in California for six years. And how do the Californians say y'all? You guys, you guys. And I find myself still often referring to, hey, you guys, how are you doing? And of course, you know, now the feminists are saying, you're not supposed to say you guys because you are insulting all the girls in the class. Uh, it's not that because uh, linguists have described that in, in the California dialect um, and many other regional dialects as well, you guys, does not have a gender distinction of referring only to males. So, uh, so that's one other way of saying y'all. Uh, have you heard of any other ways, maybe elsewhere? How about yous and yons? <laughs> you know, we go, to, we go away from to different areas. Uh, anything else? To add to that, 
But those are, those are, you know, ling language kind of fixes itself if there is a problem. And this problem actually developed over the history of the English language. Because in Old English, these were not the same forms. Uh, the U singular was, anyone? You know, uh, King, ja King James Bible or Shakespeare, what is the U there? Thou is the uh, subject form and, uh, and its object form is the. So uh, thou is one singular person and uh, the plural is, in, in Old English it was, and still in Shakespeare's English, which is early modern English, ye, yeah. So, um, thou and ye, uh, they were separate forms. So then everybody wanted to, then, then this form ye, which is the direct, direct uh, origin of you, uh, that form um, started to be used for politeness reasons. Uh, there was this, uh, you know, we can, describe how uh, thou and ye was used. Uh, thou was used for singular, uh, but then people started to use thou um, only for, for like subordinates. When you wanted to, when you had, you know, servant, you would call the servant thou, and, uh, and then, uh, then, people started to want to be more polite, and this form, ye, the plural form, started to be used in order to send a message that I'm being polite to you, even though you may be maybe my servant, but I'm being polite. So ye started to be used, then it became pronounced as you, and so uh, then we came up with this ambiguous system, because everybody, it was based basically on politeness. Okay. So how are we do doing in terms of time? We're doing very well. Okay, do you have any questions at this point? Okay, okay. Um, I um, will, did I, didn't I promise that I'm gonna give you my cellular phone number if you have like a quick question? I, I tend to be better in answering my my email than my cell, but I'll still give you my uh, cell number. And, uh, and I, at sometimes I have the cell, my phone sitting somewhere at the far end of the house and, and it may be ringing there and telling me that it's, you know, my student is trying to reach me. So the email is best. I'm kind of like, you know, obsessed with email. So I, I'm on my computer all the time and check it very often. So email is actually better and you've got my email address there on the uh, syllabus. So, um, so we've talked about description versus prescription, and there's a little exercise in the book about prescription and description. At the end, at the ends of these files, the, uh, the, the chapters are referred to as files. And um, let's see, which page? Yeah, there it is. It's on page 34 on the physical book, and it's exercise number 11. So uh, for each of these, there are five statements. Uh, each of these statements identify which ones are prescriptive, which are giving a value judgment, and which ones are descriptive, which, one are, which ones are the neutral ones, just giving a neutral statement of how things are. So it's me is ungrammatical, it's I is the only correct way to express this idea. Is this a prescriptive or descriptive statement? Yes. It's um, prescriptive. It is prescriptive. Why is it prescriptive? It's a value judgment. It's this value judgment, exactly. 
that it's the only correct way. Now, uh, how many of you, when you go to check on your friend and you knock on the door and your friend comes to the door and says, who is it? Uh, how many of you will say, it is I? No, <laughs> it's no. Um, uh, you know, we, we all would say, it's me, because that's the natural, the natural way. Um, to be completely descriptive about which one is absolutely correct, quote unquote, quote unquote, do you all see correct in trying to get this to the, there, correct in air quotation marks, correct. That's what linguists do. Proper in air quotation marks correct in air quotation marks because we don't believe in that thing. But from the point of view of the English grammar, it is I would actually be the quote unquote cor correct form, but nobody says it. Language changes. So the object form me has been taken over in this case. In, it's in a subject complement position, which is usually requiring the uh, subject form. I, it is I, but language changes and that gives, you know, headaches for people who write down English grammars. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, continue saying it's me uh, as an answer to who is it, because if you don't, you might not have those friends whose doors you can knock. Uh, B. Though ain't is regularly used in many dialects and informal styles of English, and English speakers generally understand its meaning, people who use this form may suffer some negative social consequences since ain't is often associated with lack of education and deemed to be ungramma ungrammatical by many speakers. Is this a prescriptive or descriptive statement? Yes. It's descriptive. It's descriptive because it just states how things are. You know, if you are a mass communication major, we had some here, or oh, minor. Yes. So if you want to be a TV uh, news reader, and you go to a job interview, and you are asked, um, "Do you have? Uh, do, do you know how to do this?" Uh, and you say, "I ain't got no experience in this area, but I am very good, you know, in learning." So, are you likely to get a job as a news reader? Probably not. And it's not like there's anything wrong with ain't. It is actually very proper and, and a good expression in, in a lot of English dialects. But uh, it's, it's because, you know, the people who decide whether to hire you or not, they're not linguists. So it, it would be wrong of me to say that just, you know, go on and use your dialects, go on and use your dialects in informal situations at, with, your, with your family and friends, and when you are, you know, in, in informal situations. Um, we are still not there where we could say that uh, all the dialects are equal, even though ling for linguists they are. For linguists, all dialects are equal. All languages are equal, no matter what your language is. It's as good as anyone else's language for communicative purposes. So anyway, uh, so uh, C. In casual styles of speaking, English speakers frequently end sentences with prepositions. Ending sentences with prepositions is often avoided in formal styles, however. Descriptive or prescriptive? What do you think, Michael? Prescriptive. That one I didn't really understand. Okay, let's let's think about it. Does anyone think it might be descriptive? D. De yes. Why would Joshua? Why would you think it's a descriptive statement? Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, it doesn't say that uh, ending a sentence with a preposition is bad. It, uh, it, there is no value judgment in this statement. It's kind of like just describing how things are. So uh, it is a descriptive statement, but you know, you're right, some of these are kind of you know, hard to tease apart. Absolutely. Uh, D, for any sentence beginning with there is, there's, or there are, the verb must agree in number with what comes after it, the logical subject. For example, there's something I want to, to say, and there are a few things I want to say. Are both correct, but there's a few things I want to say is always ungrammatical. Here, this is kind of like, you know, fuzzy, is it prescriptive? Is there a hidden value judgment there, or is it just descriptive, neutral? H how many of you would, would uh, see this as a prescriptive statement? Yeah, there is, it's not, you know, said clearly that this is bad, but, but it, is, it is like, you know, uh, it's always, there's a few things I want to say, it's always ungrammatical. Come on, uh, a lot of people say there, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there, there's a lot of cars on the, on the parking lot, and uh, it is in the informal situations where it's okay to have, it's technically called a subject verb agreement error, as you've learned in freshman writing, but, uh, but you know, people say it. So uh, when people say it, we need to understand that there's this continuum between formal and informal situations. And in informal situations, there's a lot of leeway of what we can say and be, you know, just normal and and actually that you know being using a very formal form in an informal situation may sometimes make us look like nerds or jerks or odd people or whatever so okay last one some speakers of english accept my mother loved as a grammatical sentence is this a descriptive or prescriptive statement D or pre? Yes. It's descriptive. It's descriptive, yes. All right. So there are a lot of exercises built in in the files. They come at the end of the end of the chapter typically, and it's always a good idea to look over them. I I'm I'm gonna say one thing, uh, because this is a, an extremely thick book. I do want you to read everything, but I will not be testing you on, like for instance, American Sign Language. There are a lot of uh, references to American Sign Language. Read them, because they make a good point that you do. American Sign Languages are natural languages as well. I mean, all sign languages are natural languages as well. Has anyone taken ASL? Okay, cool, yes. So the reason why I don't require you to know ASL in this class is because I don't speak it myself, I don't sign myself. So, um, so just read it through because it makes, they make these, these uh, examples are really good and they make the point, but, uh, but I won't be like, you know, expecting you to know that. Uh, the same thing with other languages that are foreign languages. I will give you a lot of examples uh, from, you know, different languages that you may or may not know, but I'm not be like testing you. Uh, my first language, which is Finnish, with two M's, um, is a good example of, of a very different kind of a language which does things in a different way from English. And I sometimes use examples from Finnish, basically because all linguists do, because it's a good, it is a good example because it's so different. It's not an, uh, a Germanic uh, language, it's not an Indo-European language, so it's uh, a Finno-Ugric language, totally different, different uh, language group. But um, if I give you examples of, hey, this is how English does things, this is how Finnish does things, um, I won't be testing you on 
those foreign languages. So I will specifically let you know if, if there, there are a lot of examples, exercises of the languages of the world. And I will specifically tell you if I want you to do some specific exercise, for instance, on Italian, like for instance, when we get to morphology, on Italian or on Ukrainian or Russian or whatever. So, um, so I will specifically tell you, okay, let's do this exercise, but I'm not gonna be testing you in the intricacies of those languages. Is that, is that okay? So um, anyway, what I would like you to do when you study for this class is to first read everything. In the syllabus I have marked, uh, under readings, I have marked the files that you should be reading. Like for today, I wanted you to read files 1.4 through 1.6. And read those uh, before and um, before the class then come to class and uh, and we'll go over. Uh, I give you a little lecture of it here. We'll go over perhaps some exercises and so on. And I often elaborate. I go sometimes beyond the book because it's if it if it makes something clear. So. Um, read that first and then go back and reread it because uh, to be completely frank there's a lot of new vocabulary in this in this class that you will be introduced to and the first reading you just do the first reading without like I'm not going to panic even though I don't understand that particular sentence or I don't understand that concept I will try to explain things especially the more complicated things more technically they're complicated this is not rocket science. Uh, but uh, the more technical things I'll try to explain here. And then you go back and read it again. And if with the second reading after the lecture you don't understand, put a little question mark there and send me an email. Or oh, I'll actually try to start like a blog so you can post anonymously your your questions on the blog and and, and try to do it. There's no grade for it, and that means that most students won't do it, but, uh, but uh, it's still a good idea to share your question and do it anonymously if you don't want to be like, okay, I didn't understand this, and I, I don't want to say that it was me who didn't understand it. So, um, so you're probably doing a service for the others because often if you have a question about something, then somebody else might too. And, uh, and that blog might be a better, I haven't opened it up yet, but I will. Um, it might be a better way, so that way I'm not gonna be like, you know, answering the same question 10 times. Okay, but you still can email to me also. So uh, let's talk about the knowledge of language we still have. Uh, uh, and I wish we had. Uh, okay, so 10:47. Selena, hi. Yeah, we still have the previous class, but uh, which you have already taken. But come and you can sit here. You can sit here if you want to have a review. This is a person who has, has this class, so <laughs> uh, nice to see you. So uh, let's talk about the knowledge of language a little bit. What does it mean that we have knowledge of language? It means that we are competent in that language. And um, there is this thing called native speaker competence. native speaker competence, which means that, um, how many of you are native speakers of English? I'm not, okay. I'm the only one who isn't. Um, 
Selena is a native speaker of a couple languages, right? So uh, you can be bilingual and be a native speaker of more than one language, obviously. But when you are a native speaker, you are competent. So, you know, kind of like the paradox of this class is that you all are competent in English and you are more competent in English than I am, yet I'm standing here and teaching you. Because I'm not a native speaker of English. What this means is that, uh, for instance, you can hear uh, my speaking, you can hear that uh, she's not pronouncing all the vowels the way we are pronouncing here. Or she's pronouncing some of the vowels in a way that no English native speaking dialect actually pronounces these vowels. My husband always makes fun of me when um, I say like, uh, do you want to see a movie? And he says, oh, would you like to see a movie? Movie. And then I'm like, oh, come on. You understand it's a movie. And then I try to say, do you want to see a movie? <laughs> and so it goes either from movie to movie. And neither is native English. Ooh. Like, is that close? Movie. No, it's not still. So I struggle with those things because I didn't learn English like you did from the toddlerhood. And um, I learned it, I started learning it when I was nine years old. Uh, in school, two hours per week is not enough, especially if your teacher has an accent worse than mine or stronger than mine. Worse would be a value judgment. So um, anyway, so my, my phonology is a clear sign that I'm not a competent, in that sense, a competent speaker fully competent speaker. I'm pretty competent. They let me lecture here. Uh, but uh, but uh, there are some, and sometimes I, I, um, I start to give an example, for instance, of English grammar, and I pause and I'm like asking my students, is that a good English sentence? And then you, as competent native speakers, can either say, no, it doesn't sound really good. Or you can say, yeah, it is OK. So, uh, so there is that kind of like hesitancy in some areas of language. But you know, don't worry about it. I, I've got a PhD in linguistics and, and an MA in English and another MA in English composition. So I have studied this from the theoretical point of view. So I pretty much know what I'm doing. So don't worry about that. But, uh, but anyway, just to make it, make it, make it clear that non-native uh, competence is not the same as a native competence. You have studied a, a foreign language and you know how when you have to actually use it, how you feel uncomfortable because you feel that you can't express yourself as uh, a native speaker would. Oh, we need to stop. But um, the last thing, performance, is uh, typically talked uh, referred to at the same time, performance, at the same time as competence. So competence is the abstract knowledge of language. And then performance is when a native speaker, any speaker, puts the knowledge of language, the competence, into use. And performance is never perfect. Competence is perfect for native speakers. But performance is not perfect, because we make these false starts and errors, and us, and mms, and likes, and errs, and start all over again the sentence. Anyway, I need to let you go. But uh, thank you so much for attending, either online or, and we have another person here, Kyler. Hi, Kyler. Hi, Kyler. <laughs> OK. So um, hey, do you want to say a word about yourself? Um, <laughs> OK. Well, he's here. So uh, and thank you for coming here. I really look forward to this semester in the it wasn't like the way we all want it to be, but hey, we're here, we are alive, and uh, we're making the best out of it. OK, you have a wonderful semester. I'll see you in a week. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye, thank you.